Right, in our first place of interest, as I've ever seen all, lovely view of Elizabeth Castle there. It was built in 1594 by Paul Ivy, the structural engineer of Elizabethan times, and has been added to over the course of years. The latest addition is at the very top of the castle where the Union flag is flying there. That was built in the Second World War between 1940 and 1945 when the Germans occupied the island. That long arm stretching out from the castle there with the black and white stripes in the end. But the idea of that one was to join another one coming from the land side, way down from the left there. And it was supposed to make one great big harbour for Jersey. Unfortunately, they started building the other one first and it had no protection. And the rough waters that we get around this area kept knocking it down, so they gave up on it in the end. And they continued to build the one out there in 1882. One of the reasons for the castle was to house the Lieutenant Governor in 1600 to 1603. The first Lieutenant Governor to live out there was Sir Walter Raleigh. It was him who called it for Isabella Bellissima, Elizabeth the Most Beautiful. Later in that same century, it was home to Charles II who was exiled from England. He took refuge out there. And because of Jersey's loyalty to Charles in those days, he rewarded them with a deed to New Jersey, which are still held today in St. Bond's Manor, at the west of the island. The only person to live out at the castle now is the garden, and there's a holiday home too. There's two ways out to the castle, amphibious vehicles, the ducks, the cuddle ducks, that you get from West Park or we've just pulled away from. And when the tide's down, there's a raised for park that you can walk across the castle. Oh, oh, oh. <coughs> it should have been climbed to the island in the 1930s. Over the sea walls where you've landed. Tidal conditions right, dragon refuge and the heaven dead craft out here. It's very much of a makeshift airport, covered oil drums and a plank of wood is what you set on waiting right for your plane. Try to say the tide comes up to the sea wall and everything has to be moved off the beach. It's the timetable of the aircraft went for the tidal flow too. It wasn't until 1937 that the airport moved out to the west of the island of St. Peter's, where it is today. Now we've been talking a little bit about the tides already. Jersey is situated in the Bay of North River Shell, and that's what gives her the second highest rise of fall tide in the world. You can have as big as 40 foot tide. Oh, Not only do they come up to the sea wall, but it's the wind behind them they well and truly can come over and can cause a lot of flood damage too. Jersey's rocks and reefs between the six miles of the sandy beaches are all perfectly safe, just so long as you know what the tide's doing before you go exploring around the world. And when we do have these big tides, it moves very fast up and down on the beaches. Over the sea wall across the bay of St. Hogan, you can see the white of the buildings there and the boats in front of the harbour. Well, that's where we're going and that's where the train would have run all those years ago. In 1871, the first train left Jersey Western Railway Company with Jersey Tourism is today. And it travelled all the way around here, way around to St. Hogan. It then continued over the hill there, another three and a half miles, to the southwest point of the island called Corbier. That was a Jersey Western Railway Company, and it ran until the 1930s. We also had another railway company, the Jersey Eastern Railway, and that ran from another part of town, round the east coast, to Bawley, to the other castle that we had. Between the two railway companies, they carried over the people. But one 
time, however, there was a big fire in St. Hogan, and it destroyed all the rolling stock. That, along with cars and buses coming to the island, it paid for the Jersey East and Western Railway Company, and they went what we called on disaster, or you probably know better, as bankrupt. The only time the railway lines were used again was in the Second World War. The Germans used them to transport the sand and the stone and the shingle east and west around the island to build the bunkers that we can see today. This area that we're driving into is called First Tower. It's called First Tower because across the road was the first of 30 towers built during the Napoleonic Wars, the late 18th, early 19th century. It's the Jersey Tower as opposed to a Martello Tower. The Martello Tower is much more rounder, more like a Christmas pudding bowl in shape. As you can see, the Jersey Tower is more like a roof or a castle. The top of this tower would have had two cannons. Twelve soldiers would have fired muskets out the windows. And if the attackers had got too close, one in hot oil would have been poured out those lumps around the very top. For which they sort of poured. There's 22 of these towers left around the east, west and south of the island. The Germans used some of them as target practice in the Second World War. Today they used the storage spaces as warehouses, and one in particular is an amateur radio station. These towers are all situated at sea level. The most vulnerable part of attack for Jersey in those days. And also, as you can see, got the most spectacular views from them too. That's why there's talk of painting some of them into holiday homes. The highest point of the island is in the north of the island, 450 feet above the sea level. Jersey's rectangle in shape and measures nine by five miles. But when we had those big tides that I was telling you about earlier, the tide can go as far as four and a half miles out, giving an extra landmass of 18 miles to the island. The island's divided up into 12 parishes, all of different sizes, shapes and population. But they all have certain things in common. They all have a constable who's in charge of his parish. He's the father of the parish. And he's voted in by his parishioners. Centineers and Bantineers help him run his parish too. St. Hay is the most densely populated parish, but not the biggest in size by far. There's 87,700 people on the island. Every parish has a parish school, pub, church, and a parish hall. And they also all have access to the sea, to the coast. And this brings back to medieval times. And if you committed a crime years ago, you had a chance to see your punishment. You stayed eight nights in the parish church, and on the ninth day you walked down what's called a sanctuary path, a path to freedom, and the sled to the coast. Whilst you were on this path, no one could harm you or punish you. When you got to the coast, hopefully there was a friend of yours waiting there with a boat who would take you off the island. You'd see your punishment all right, but you were exiled from the island. You were probably taken to France. The other reason to access to the beach was to start go collecting seaweed, or wreck as we call it. Go down near the go with your horse and car and collect the seaweed off the beach. Take it back and spread it over the fields. Having the most cheapest fertilizer, the most natural one too. 